thank you so much, Fozzie, and it really is an honor to be here. It's an honor to be back in Washington uh, here at IFPRI, a great institution, and Schengen Fen, I want to thank you and your whole team uh, for having me here. But also, what an honor to stand uh, in the shoes of Martin Foreman, and I want to welcome the family. Sasha, your whole family is here. It's really great. Um, but a legacy that was started before the world was really focused on nutrition. Um, today, I have a chance to reflect. Uh, until April, I was on the front lines of this battle in the World Food Program, you know, very intensive, and I find myself doing a lot of reflecting, stepping back on where are we, and I find myself losing sleep over the issue of are we where we need to be. And so today I'm going to offer a few frank reflections on where we are and a few thoughts on ideas to provoke thinking on where we might think about uh, continuing the efforts in the battle against hunger and malnutrition, if this works. I know in Washington you're focused on one kind of a cliff. I know it's preoccupying uh, minds here in Washington, and today I'm going to ask us to focus on a different kind of a cliff, and today I want to talk about the food cliff. I want to talk about the fact that whatever challenges we're having now, it's only getting more intense as thousands of people are added to the table every day who need a decent meal and a healthy meal. And as we know, we will have to add 2 billion more people to the food and nutrition supply chain in the coming decades. This requires the attention of all of the leaders of the world and the citizens of the world to take on this challenge. In fact, over the next 40 years, we need to produce more food than the last 8,000 years combined. So if we think we're stretching right now, how do we get to where we need to be? This to me is the preoccupying question uh, of our time. What is our target? I have a full quote here from the Committee on World Food Security, in part because this really was an epic moment. I know sometimes people say text and all the texts in the UN, but getting the world to come to an agreement on the first four words here, food and nutrition security, was about three years of intensive debate so just, this reminds me of how far we've come. It truly was a question, less than five years ago, if nutrition and food belonged in the same sentence. It truly was a question as to whether or not we could find agreement on that point. And there were many other things. What did the words climate change and food have to do with each other? That was a question five years ago. What does water and food have to do? And so our thinking has advanced greatly. And I want to mark this moment because we do have agreement on a definition. And this allows people to organize around a goal. And I think embedding food and nutrition security together is absolutely critical, as we'll talk about. Are we on track? And I'll spend a moment exploring this, but I want to assure you as we do, I am an optimist. But let's take a hard look at some of the reality. Okay, reality number one, there is more than enough food today. So the edible crop harvest in the world's more than 4,600 kilocalories per day already. Now, if we extract the things that come out of that, loss and food uh, use as fodder and a few other things, you get down to still a very adequate diet for your average size man, 2,700 kilocalories. 
So there's a gap here. There's an issue here that we have to confront. And in reality, what happens, what this means, is that every 10 seconds today, even with enough food on Earth, we lose a child to hunger. Let me talk about those we don't lose and what's happening inside the child. In 2007, The Lancet published a landmark series of articles concluding that a child will never, brain will never recover from lost nutrition in the first thousand days from conception to about two, three years. And I call this the burden of knowledge because I remember the day I wrote that, and in fact, I wrote the forward for that, and saying everything has to change now because it's not like it can be made up for later. So this is uh, from a university in Chile that's done really, as you know, Chile has been a leader in this issue and looking at the brain scan of two, three-year-old children, one that was malnourished and neglected and one that had enough. But what they find is that the brain size actually is much smaller and this cannot be retrieved if it happens in those early days of life. Also, as devastating are the neurons in the brain that don't form. And so what the research showed was that these neurons will never form if they're not formed during that period in utero and then after birth. And so this really became the organizing device, I think, in my life and public policy in dealing with food and nutrition to say we have to change our priorities and we have to change our strategies. So the hidden hunger, as we sometimes call it, although it can be quite evident, uh, affects about two billion people in the world today. And you can see this heat map of where the effect is most dramatic. But what I like to point out is that this is not just about compassion. It's not just about um, the right thing to do. It's also about hard economic facts. So what we know from research by the World Food Program, IFPRI and others, is the, and the World Bank is the loss to GDP in countries that have a high burden of malnutrition is quite dramatic. Six to 11% in some of the studies we've done in Latin America, but the total loss to the most 36 countries with the highest levels of malnutrition, as this map shows. And I know we have people listening by podcast, but it's a map of the world showing the lost GDP is about $4.3 trillion. Now, the World Bank estimates that with intensive targeted nutrition interventions of about $10.3 billion, we could start seeing this changing. So this points to me a very cost-effective Point and why I really sought to meet with finance ministers and prime ministers and presidents about this challenge, not just health ministers or aid ministers. There are a few game changers, and I want to talk about them and acknowledge them. And the first one I'd like to talk about are the partnerships to produce and expand access to affordable, nutrient-dense, fortified foods. Um, You'll see one here. I'll pass around a couple packs of this. You all might be familiar with Plumpy Nut or these. These are lipid-based, fat-based products that do not require the addition of water or refrigeration that can withstand different temperatures. It can be made with different base products. This one's made with chickpeas, dried milk, and it has the panel needed to protect a child's brain and body. And these products are revolutionizing, can revolutionize the face of nutrition on the ground. This one cost about 17 cents a packet to produce, base cost. They can be produced in small mobile factories. And this ability to deliver the nutrition punch in a base that really makes that nutrition receptive to the child is very, very powerful. And so I just want to pass a few of these around. 
but this, these are the oral rehydration salts of our time. Oral rehydration salts changed the reality for children. These will change the reality also. I'll pass around the plumpy nut that is made with a peanut base. And I just want to introduce you to a young child I met in southern Somalia last year. Uh, he was on the front lines of a war zone. He was with tens of thousands of other people who were literally starving to death. And uh, I was with Prime Minister of Australia, Kevin Rudd. And he asked five weeks later, he was haunted by Sadak, and he said, please, can we, I understand how he is. Now, at the time, we really didn't have that much access in Somalia, and all we could do is work with UNICEF and others to try to reach these children, but our main vehicle for intervention were these packets of food. And five weeks later, after Sadak had access to the uh, nutrient-dense lipid food, uh, this is the picture that was taken of him. It is like putting water on a plant that is dried up. And children, it just doesn't cut it to give them a bowl of rice or a porridge if they're in stages of malnutrition that are intense. We also know that, um, you'll see a lot of my WFP heritage here, but you can fortify food. I'm showing these uh, sprinkles produced by DSM in partnership when we were at the United Nations that add the essential vitamins to basic porridge. So if you look at the nutrition profile of many of the basic foods in the world, they do not have micronutrients in them. This is about a one to two cent solution that can change that to a power packed meal. Let us remember, Breastfeeding is the original first answer, and if you go to countries like Niger or Mali, less than 10% of the women are breastfeeding. It is not modern in what is now believed. It's not the cool thing to do, but it's essential. And I've seen mothers feeding babies a bottle of tea rather than breastfeed them. So we have to change this we need a movement of support of women that breastfeed, but guess what? Often the mothers have no nutrients in their own bodies. And so I'm putting out a few calls in this presentation, and one thing we need is, is we need people to take on the cause of developing a nutrient-dense food for pregnant and lactating mothers. We know they need a different nutrition profile. And I know the world's taxed even creating these new products, but we need the nutrients in the mother so she can transmit them to the baby in utero and in breastfeeding. And this um, is needed to be able to take into the, even the most challenging places of the world. Game changer two, partnerships which empower smallholder farmers and the hungry and rural women with a handshake, not only a hand up or a handout. Well, I think we're in the era of the handshake. We're in the era of partnerships. I don't care how devastated someone is, they want a chance to build their life. And if you go to any refugee camp, any difficult place in the world, people want a chance to invest in their own future. Many of you know about Purchasing for Progress that the World Food Program did with Howard Buffett and Bill Gates and now with many nations. I say the 1% tells the story of the 99% because even though it's less than 1% of WFP's purchases, WFP purchases from the world's most forgotten farmers, those who would never connect to markets, thereby allowing them to become part of the solution and to enrich their own life. Um, I want to just tell this story because one of the chronic reasons why people are malnourished and hungry in the world is that they don't have access to basic infrastructure. And so I don't know who we have here from the World Bank. The World Bank and others deal with these big structural issues, and we need to, of infrastructure. But sometimes it's as simple as a cinder block warehouse. And I don't know how many of you would know that if you travel throughout the developing world, 
most of the small farmers do not have access to any materials to protect the food that they harvest. So they have to sell the food right away, eat it, or lose it. And when you sell it all during harvest, you get very low prices. So in northern Cameroon, WFP noticed a cycle of hunger cycle, and where every season the harvest would come, people would eat well, the rains would come, people would not have food, and they'd end up with malnutrition and food aid coming in year after year. But the question was, could we instead invest in permanent warehouses, one per village? See the cinder block building here, and use it as a food bank. Well, what I love about this story is no one in the village trusted putting their food in a group warehouse. This is all they have, and even if it doesn't work perfectly, to hand it over to some system, how do you trust? And so what I've also learned is if you want a solution, go to the women of the village. So in this case, we went to the women, and they said, create three keys in the door. And people have to be elected to hold the key. And the door doesn't open without the three keys, and this will solve the problem. So the three keys in the door allowed these warehouses to be deployed to hundreds of villages that broke the cycle of needing the food aid. And at least when I last checked, Alan and Renee from WFP and others, when I last checked, some of those villages were creating their own school feeding programs. Some were helping other villages do the same thing. Um, another thing, and I, I apologize for my focus, but I've lived these stories, is the ability to deliver food by satellite or by phone or by card, assistance that's targeted. So here in the West Bank, no longer does the WFP bring in food, but gives people a card and they can redeem it at a store and get eight healthy food items. They could only get yogurt or bread or eggs or milk. And this increased the dairy industry by more than 30% in one year in this area near Hebron. But also, it enriches the diet. So this became a win-win-win, a big win for the local farmers, a big win for the shopholders. He was really happy. A win for the women and their children. But these types of solutions that have a nutrition mindset are very critical. Game changer three to scale sustainable circular food economy innovations and collaboration. And I just want to again point out, we all know now the story of zero hunger in Brazil. I remember going there after reading in an IFPRI report that Brazil was beating hunger and malnutrition faster than any nation on earth. And I went on a journey and I went with Brazilian officials out to the field to learn the way this worked, but it is a circular approach where the smallholder farmers sell to the schools. The schools have a nutritionist, and the nutritionist makes sure that it's a healthy diet. The children and the families can get access to these services and a bit of cash if they get vaccinations and if they get good grades. And you only get it for three children. And so I remember sitting in the home of a one smallholder farmer. At the center of their house was a, a table, which was to study. Because they said, if the child, my, our child studies and gets good grades, we will break the cycle of hunger and malnutrition and poverty. We're selling our food to the school. We have a guaranteed market. Our kids are, have vaccinations. And the woman said, I wanted to have many more children, but I'm only going to have three. Because I know if I have three, I can succeed. We can break the cycle of poverty, and we're going to buy more land soon. And so this type of program, at scale, in a nation, bringing down the hunger numbers. I want to point out a program I'm involved with at the World Economic Forum, Grow Africa. Grow Africa is an idea of bringing together high quality investment, transparent investment, into the farmers of Africa and pairing those up with the needs and directives of African nations. So if you look at this triangle, Grow Africa and the new vision for agriculture, working with the African Union and NEPAD, 
who have a great strategy on this, but ensuring food security and environmental sustainability while creating jobs and opportunity. These kind of models are changing the face of this. And what I love is the focus on the entire value chain. Uh, Grow Africa, at the summit we had in Addis Ababa in May, uh, over 140 companies came together, many for the first time in Africa, many buying African food from distant traders, and made over $3 billion of letters of intent to invest in Africa in transparent best practices investment with eight nations in Africa. Uh, Feed the Future, uh, Raj Shah and his really incredible leadership uh, working with Hillary Clinton, President Obama and others to look at a holistic approach to the US programs. And we could go into all of these, but again, a new model, the Sun Movement, I remember being at the World Bank, Schengen, when we all sat around the table, and it was the first time that agriculturalists and nutritionists and economists and finance ministers all met together and said, we all hands to the wheel on this, and uh, the Sun Movement's really led. And then I just want to point out some others, including some of the work here at IFPRI, but also work by companies like Unilever and others to create sustainable supply chains. It is amazing if you get market leaders coming together saying we're only going to buy sustainable palm oil, they worked with Greenpeace on this, how it drives innovation down the supply chain. So the fact when we talk about public-private partnerships, it's not just doing a project together. It's rethinking the world. It's rethinking the way we do business. This can drive massive change for the benefit uh, because of that demand, people benefit then from different sustainable models. Um, okay, another call needed, a collaboration on food waste from farm to fork. We worry about that food cliff coming in the future. We could meet the whole thing by cleaning up the waste we have in food. The food industry, the food economy is the least efficient economy we probably have. I don't know that to be a fact. I welcome any economist to let me know the real answer. But it is massively inefficient. And in fact, it hasn't really changed that much in its, its economic macro approach than where we were decades ago. So you've had innovations. But if you look at the waste along the supply chains, even in the inputs, which are not used holistically, so we found, for example, even when you produce beer, the hops, the leftover has great nutritious value, the yeast, all of these things that we discard now as waste could be part of the solution. So just in the US alone, the NDRC predicts we could feed 25 million people. And in the US, we have a lot of hunger. I think it's estimated now by the US food banks to be about 48 million Americans who are food insecure. So this is not a problem just for the developing world. Game changer for leaders can be inspired to act and make a difference. I just point this out because I remember when the silent tsunami hit in 2008, there was no coordinated response. And I remember looking at the phone at my desk thinking, who do you call? It's all going crazy. Who do we call? And that has changed. And we have to take note of that. Awareness has changed, and the ability to meet and be focused and answer that the response, all of these things happened after that call. It was the first time industry leaders meeting with heads of state, meeting with regional organizations, I mean, put on the G8 and the G20 agenda, very critical. Uh, ban Ki-moon created a coordinating commitment, but also you know, pointing out that never before have we seen, it's not just for Sun, but for all of these efforts, such a collaborative effort. I got involved in this issue during this famine. My daughter was just born. I was watching on TV. I held her in my arms, and I was nursing. And there was a picture of a woman like this holding her baby 
and she couldn't answer the cry of the baby. Excuse me. But what I remember thinking at the time is this is insanity. It's insanity because we actually know how to solve this problem. And what bothered me was not that there aren't insoluble problems in the world and human suffering, but this one, hunger and malnutrition, we have the answers. And I committed then to commit my life to trying to solve this problem. That's my daughter at that time. <laughs> but that's what drove me. And so for all of our institutions, we have to ask the why. The why. What is motivating us? What are we doing? And we have to, as Silicon Valley and others have found, if we put the customer at the center, it can change everything. Then you can be great. And our customer is those hungry children in the world who have nobody focused on solving their problem. But when you put them at the center, many of you know my famous red cup, the reason why this cup was so important to me is it reminded me this is what it's all about. A very simple thing, can every child on earth get at least one cup of nutritious food a day? And when you look at that and you meditate on that problem, it leads to all sorts of inspiration and frustrations, but it leads to a different way at looking at the problem. So let me just tell you something it actually took me, being a little distant from this, to actually look at. The hunger numbers have not shifted. The pr proportion has. But strangely, from 1969, when FAO started counting, to now, we have always about 800 million hungry people. It goes up or down in a band, but pretty much. What is this? And why is it these numbers don't shift, really? And in fact, if anything, we've seen some of the highest numbers we've ever seen. Paul Pullman, the CEO of Unilever, who's become quite a leader on these issues, asked in the Financial Times just last week, is it because the warning bells ring so loudly that no one seems to hear them? And what I worry about now is because there's been so much attention on these issues and so much activity that we almost have a complacency setting in. We must be dealing with it because we talk about it, we acknowledge it, and we realize it's a challenge. But if you actually look at the numbers and you look where we are, we really need to change things. So I'm going to just list a few thoughts I have on some of the things that may change things. First, prioritizing urgent nutrition to pregnant women and young children. I know we have done this in a way things have shifted, but I think we have to really up that focus. Uh, really, it's, it, the investment is so critical. Secondly, to change our view of hunger. People run from it because they see it as a massive problem, but if you look at it instead as an opportunity, to create win-win opportunities. Because, in fact, when you solve the hunger problem, you're creating a food economy. And people benefit all the way up and down the value chain. And so for the small farmers of the world, what they want, again, is not needing to be dependent, but they want to be able to participate in a food economy. And in many places in the world, those opportunities don't exist. Third is we have a lot of models we have them in the richer world. We have them in the poorer world. All created post-World War II or post-independence. We have policy structures and approaches that are outdated. They may have meant food security back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, but they're really inappropriate for our time. And I would love to see a track two dialogue that instead of getting into the politics of policies and change, really looks at what kind of food economy do we need in the 21st century to 
put some fresh air into this thinking. But if we want a food secure world, we'd actually create it quite differently than what maybe was appropriate after World War II and maybe was appropriate post-independence in Africa and other nations. Fourth, to urgently address the massive policy gaps in the developing world on land and investment. We need to see vastly stepped up investment because ultimately it's not an aid model, it's actually an economic model that has to work within countries and there are many countries that do not have a framework for even knowing how to, uh, to build the type of food economy that would be sustainable and lasting. And so those policies are not a mystery, but they need to happen. And with the new alliance launched with the G8, I know this has been a focus of uh, Raj Shah and others to look at those gaps. Five, to scale up what works, put the dollars behind proven models that build resiliency, we know what works, we actually do. There's many models that do, and we're still all over the place, and I think we need a prioritization effort that's quite tough to really support those things that are proven to work. Six, to, to promote diverse solutions. End the war between large-scale and small-scale ag agriculture. I don't think, personally, ever it's gonna be either or. I think we have to accept that there'll be many different models. And with 70% of the food in the world produced by smallholder farmers, that's not going to change dramatically anytime soon. And with so many nations benefiting from the type of larger approach to agriculture, I just think they both have a critical role to play and we need to set up the dialogue to understand the learnings in both systems and what works to end hunger and malnutrition. Seven, to radically reduce waste from farm to fork. We need to look at the efficiency of the system and utilizing everything in it, including the byproducts, can change the life of the hungry poor throughout the world. Eight, deploy innovative technologies. I know um, the um, Technologies exist. You do not see them forward deployed in the world. And to me, it's like, I remember where we were on vaccinations and access to HIV AIDS medicines. We need to look at a game changer to make sure those technologies that allow for a drop of water to be put on a seed rather than flooding a field can be accessed uh, and, and others. Nine, leadership. I just put out an appeal to the G8 and the G20 to not drop food from the agenda. This is very critical. It has been on the agenda of the G8 and the G20 since the food crisis. We are not out of the woods. In fact, scientists and policy experts predict we may be in for one hell of a year in 2013. But also, if you look at the long-term dynamics, we are not out of the woods. And there's no other place in the world that the nexus between food, energy, and water can be looked at at a leadership level except the G20. And so I would really urge the leaders of the nations involved, but everyone to make sure this stays on the agenda. It is absolutely critical. And 10th, I just want to say, I think we need a paradigm shift in our thinking, a track to dialogue on what a food economy for the 21st century looks like. We know it has to be more sustainable. We cannot add 2 billion people to food systems the way they currently operate. At the local level, people talk about a circular economy. I think we could think of that even at a global level of utilizing all that goes in rather than just having a linear approach to it and integrating the reality of the, the, the water and energy pressures into scalable, sustainable solutions. They exist. I've seen them out there. I'll leave you with a thought. This battle is winnable, but we need a paradigm shift in our thinking. The numbers are not adding up. 
Thank you. Thank you.